Welcome to this episode of Tig's Bits Podcast. This morning, which is a little early than we normally record, but we got a guy that's so busy, this is about the only time he's got between breaking world records and conquering the world of sports media and music journalism and everything else. Welcome to the show, my brother, Mr. Marty Smith. What's up, Marty? With say, the party? boys, good morning. Yeah, it's uh, morning. hell for you guys. It's what eight o'clock. It is yeah. <laughs> bright and early, boys. That's a hell of an ask on my part to drag y'all out of bed this early. However, oh man, uh, no, it's a it's a trial <laughs> run for tailgating, Marty. I mean, this is you know I'm an LSU guy. It's time. It's time to get get the blood flowing. Start to get up early. You know, so this is just part of the part of the ritual. So, do you just did you did you just like put a put a damn bourbon IV in your arm? Is that part of y'all's <laughs> pregame action all, there? Because pretty I, much, I'm, pretty much, there are very few places uh, that are like that, that that are like that place. And I get asked all the time, "What is the best experience in college football?" And I'm very fortunate. I've seen a lot of them. But Saturday yeah. night in Death Valley uh, is – there's nothing like it. Uh, there's just, there's yeah, just I, nothing like it, man. And I love so many different experiences throughout college football. I love whiteouts at Penn State. That's an amazing experience. Being down in Oxford for the game day experience is wonderful. But, man, ladies and gentlemen, the sun <laughs> has made its way toward the western sky – and it is Saturday night in Death Valley. There's just nothing yes. like it. Not a thing, man. <laughs> I made it over giving that way me chill twice. bumps right from the jump. It gives me chills too, and I don't do it worth a damn. I can't, <laughs> I can't say it right, but boy, I know, I know what's up. You know hey, what's we, up. We were talking last week about the uh, the hype videos. How they there's nothing you can do now with the modern advent of these hype videos. There's nothing you can do as a casual fan that you can do to escape it now because as soon as they play one of those hype videos a month before preseason or before the a day game or the you know whatever team inter squad game is there's they have gotten so good at these hype videos that they will just make you run through a dang brick wall (laughs) has it not you don't want to escape it i mean if you love college football if you love college football that is the primer for the the anticipation of labor day weekend and I will tell you, Jr. What has that's that's one of the key evolutions of college football programs over the last several years is the importance of those videos, and not just the preseason ones, but the random Tuesday in October. Yeah, because yep. not only do they keep the fan base engaged and the fan base excited, they also are used. Uh, in recruiting right and yeah. these young people who are being recruited not just as football players or basketball players or softball players but students we part of the human element is we want to be part of something bigger than self we want to feel belonging and those videos have become so important in the overall scope of student body recruitment certainly in football recruitment and the fact that so many of them are done by students themselves right, is right. remarkable. And like that's what Cameron wants to do. My son's a senior in high school right now. He wants to edit video. That's what he wants his profession Neat. to be. And I keep telling him uh, what you want to be doing is, you know, go to these kids that play football at your school and tell them, hey, I'll make you a video. Mm-hmm. Yep. And – just yeah, start getting yeah. that stuff on paper. He's really talented, if I do say so. But oh, I awesome. can imagine. So it probably runs in the blood. They are very there. important. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, and when we were all, because we're all relatively the same age, when we were all coming up in high school, I mean, it was literally a VCR tape that coaches would put together with splicing camcorders together to send off. And now I've seen some of those that my friends put out for their kids in middle school and high school, and they look like what college did then. But mm-hmm. now the college ones are the, as, as good as any ESPN put-together package or WWE package or anything, the way they put these things together. The, yeah. the thing that's most oh. interesting to me is this. I was just talking – Netflix is doing a, bit, a NASCAR series. 
a la Full Swing or Drive to Survive oh. about the playoffs that are getting ready to start here in a couple of weeks. And they came over to my house, and I did this, like, three-hour interview for them. And I was talking about how special it was as a kid. I can remember sitting on the edge of the church pew with my daddy with a, a stance, like with a posture that as soon as amen came out of his mouth, we were darting for the door because the only – we didn't want to miss the green flag at Wilkesboro right. or Martinsville or Talladega. But that was the only time we got to see NASCAR. Now, with where we are, fast forward 30 years, you can consume as much as you want when you want. All right? I actually right. said that I think that that's – sort of diluted that product a little bit. But now you think about college football, for those of us in the South especially, we want as much as we can possibly consume. All of and it. And <laughs> isn't that interesting how – and I could be dead-ass wrong, y'all. I could be totally wrong about the NAS hardcore NASCAR fan. They may want all of it. But I know the hardcore college football fan does. Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. Well, is, it's sure. like anything. There's there's no playbook. We don't know what the what's going to happen when we make these little turns in, in society or in media and things. You don't know if you don't know what it's going to do. What's the chain reaction going to cause? Well, like you were saying earlier, these the student athletes getting to see these hype videos as well. You know, a lot of these athletes may or may not ever even get the chance to visit these campuses. But watching that hype video, and I know you and I talked about it last time. We caught up uh, a couple months ago because you had just traveled to uh, to somewhere, and we were talking about stadiums and and, and how how amazing these facilities are, you know. And now that's what they do when they're clipping in their hype videos. It's not just on field stuff. It's showing the locker room. It's showing walking through the locker room with the, you know, I mean, just these damn near billion dollar uh, locker rooms and field houses they have with the hologram projectors and the rings and the glow in the yeah, dark yeah. and the laser stuff. I mean, it's just yeah, gotten it's to a point that it, it's, it's, I mean, it's as big as it's ever been. And, and like you said, it could take away from some, but boy, it sure does. It helps the other one. So it's, that's a good, that's a good, good something to no, think it is, about. It is. And, it, and it's it really like you're is. there, you know what I mean? Like you get to experience the, what's going on at that place. Right. So you get, you haven't even been there, but you've seen so much there that you feel like that you've that you've already been there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and it's like, I mean, it's the same thing. It's like this in, in fall camp when John Summerall, you know, they were doing a hype video, and he's standing there in the middle of the field, and he's talking, we're in the vet, lock the gates. You know, it's time to go. And, man, I, dude, I, like I said that day, I went out and cut my grass with passion. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I I'm just it. a fan, you know? So right. it's – it, it's 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 super awesome to see that man and like give me more anytime something pops up i'm gonna consume it i'm gonna watch it you know what i mean so yeah it's 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 awesome to see man that was kind of my next lead in was going to be there you know uh marty we had on john coach john summerall troy's head football coach a few weeks ago and uh blasey and i both went to troy state together um and and we were talking about the evolution with him, you know, because when I was in school, it was literally you walk up with your student ID, you put your beer over here on one side of the fence, you walk up with your student ID, you go right around the fence, you pull the beer through the fence, you walk in. I mean, it was nothing. <laughs> it, we didn't have the it, we didn't have the end zones filled in. We didn't have luxury boxes. I mean, same thing with Fieldhouse. And now, twenty years after I was there, I go back and it's like, oh my gosh, stadium looks like what Bryant Diddy Bryant right. Diddy did to me then as as an eighteen yeah. year old. Um, and just the everybody coming up. And that was one thing I wanted to talk about today is, you know, uh, Tiggs being in Louisiana and us being Troy guys. You know, I see two lanes in the top 25 to start the year after a great run last year. Troy with a 12-2 and two season, one of the best we've had in a long time. Getting votes, getting votes. Getting votes. Do you think the playing field, it's going to be more even playing field now with the, with the way everything's restructured, with the conferences all aligning to where it's looking like we're going to have a, even less big conferences uh, but with the NIL and, and, and everything that's involved, do you think the, it's even the playing field or do you think it's going to separate it even more? I don't know. Uh, it is uh, – no, no, nobody does. No. Right. But when you look at it on paper, here's what I see. Hmm. All right, so first and foremost, the college football that I fell in love with as a kid is dead. It's extinct. Yep. All right. And – I am all for, and 
So are the coaches, by the way, despite the fact that some people are analyzing what the coaches are saying as anti-NIL. That's not the truth. Every coach that I've talked to is for the players benefiting from their performance, from their brand, et cetera. Where it's gotten a little haywire is originally NIL was instituted for that reason. All right. You name them. Bryce Young, random example. Bryce Young wins the Heisman Trophy. Bryce Young, uh, you know, is is a generational talent. Bryce Young deserves to benefit from that. But that's not what it is. It is pay for play. And that is not what it was designed to be. And it's pay for play to the point where states have passed legislation that benefits their in-state universities to offer greater benefits in recruiting. That is not what it was designed to be. But that's what it is right now. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, add the portal in there, and what happens? There is great. There's a great chance that Troy's best players are going to be courted by Power Five schools. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, are your best players going to go? Okay, maybe I was overlooked in recruiting, but because I've shown out over here at Troy, now Power Five school X Y Z want to give me an opportunity. And, oh, by the way, they say they're going to pay me to come there. (laughs) What are are them kids going to do? They're going to go every time. Because you can't match match checkbooks with those big schools. I mean, you just can't when you talk about the the, the backer base at those big schools. And then, conversely, there's going to be the young people who got an opportunity at a big school, maybe it didn't work out, and they're going to be able to jump in the portal and go to another university that may not be Power 5 or or whatnot. So it's very transient now. Yeah. And it's just a very different experience than it was for if, 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 if J.R. saying we're all the same age than what we grew up with. Right. And it is. Yeah. And so now you on top of that, I I wonder what the next shoe to drop is. We've seen all the conference realignment, and we have Big Ten schools in Los Angeles, and we have (laughs) – you. I mean, it's it's just like it's all over the place. Right. And and so, you know, what does that really mean? Football's fine. Football is king because football pays for all the other sports. And the networks, ours included, are paying for the right to put football on TV. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, what does that mean for swimming and diving? What does that mean for volleyball? I don't know. That's why I opened the the discussion. I don't know what any of this means. Yeah, yeah, it's... If you... you, I wonder at which point... And this may never happen, but I, folks like Jim Harbaugh are advocates for this. When you're talking about damn near nine figures of school in television revenue for member institutions, at what point does that make its way to the player level? Yeah. Right? Because they're the ones putting on the show. Well, if it makes its way to the player level, what happens then? All those guys got to deal with all that income. And so there's a lot, there's a lot going on here, man. And there really is. There's never been a period that had this much change at once, this influx of alterations all at the same time. So we're all still processing what it all means because nobody really knows. Right. I, I can't imagine being 18, 19 years old 
making multiple millions of dollars mm-hmm. potentially even hey a hundred thousand dollars when i 19 years old and i i mean i feel like i've won the lottery and i could move to mars you know what i mean it's hundred thousand like, dollars at 47 <laughs> years old is a lot of money it right. is yeah. it, it, I mean, it's a lot it of is. money i don't care how much money you a got a lot of money that's a lot of money. that's right that's right yeah, and and marty you bring up a good point you know talking about this thing it's such a complicated wheel and there's so many moving parts to this thing it's like so as a you know as a smaller school guy as a group of five guy here a little plug to the group of five guys podcast there unintentionally <laughs> but uh so but no it's being a group of five person and a troy fan you know you look where we had where are we winning right now well i think we've been winning lately because we've had a great coach where he's doing great things there we're not losing those people to the portal they know they can go there and they can be on television they can start and they can showcase their talent and they're choosing that right now and we're able to also fill holes in depth and bring in players because of the portal where they're you know somebody else is playing somewhere and not happy and we're increasing depth and we're playing like John Summerall's done a great job of managing that portal really well to his advantage, but it can flip so rapidly. You know, suddenly he leaves and another coach comes in, and then there's just this great, you know, escape with players leaving. So it's 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 so fickle right now, and there's so many different directions it could go. I'd like to think, hey, the, the playoffs open up next year. Now, as a team like a Troy or anybody else in, in the group of five conferences, there is a pathway to get to the playoffs and have your opportunity but who who knows what's going to happen between now and then, man? It's 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 so, you know, it's 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 like I said, it's very fickle, and I don't know which way it's going to go either. So there's we'll so see. much talent, there's so much talent everywhere. Yeah, and you know the Sun Belt, for example, there is so much talent in that league, and that league is so strong, and the brands within the league are so strong and they've been very smart at championing and ensuring and showcasing rivalries Mm -hmm. in that league. Yep. And I just think they've done a really good job in that league. I just, I, I love that conference. I love the entertainment value of the conference. Uh, if you're a college football fan, then, that they've done such a good job uh, with the the programs are strong. So many of them are strong, and I mean, I was yeah. talking about this on another podcast. There's a young man named Caden Smith who played at Appalachian State, and he has a, a podcast that really focuses on the Sun Belt. And I mean, when you look at the fact that as good as JMU is, random example, right? Yeah, they couldn't even compete for the postseason yet. And when they can, uh, look out because uh, they have built a great program there. And, you know, you have the Marshalls and you have the Troys and you have the Appalachian States and the Georgia Southerns and all these schools that are established like passionate fan bases and great players. And I just – my hat's off to, to that league because they have navigated all of this so well. And and they it's really like have. and like Blasey yeah. said, it's so hard to navigate that portal. Um, I, I mean, the best coaches have problems. Twenty four seven three. And it doesn't matter. The crazy thing that that I that I talk about with people is when it when it goes down right after the season ha- ends, and this happened just uh, in last year's season when Georgia won the national championship. Three months later, one of their second best wide receiver announces he's going to Alabama who they just beat in the national right. championship game. <laughs> right. I mean, that seems <clears throat> something we would never thought we'd be able to say in our lifetime. You know, used to, you had to sit out a year and this kind of stuff, but now with it, you're like, you won, you beat it. And now you're going to play for the team you beat and won the championship with. But when you have all those deals back in the back end, there's no telling what – used to you could say, why? Well, they didn't win, so we can go over here. I want to play with this coach or I want to play with this player I went to high school with. But now who knows why they're actually making these decisions. And to swap between la- – would seem lateral movements uh, seems absurd back in the day, but now it's just common practice. It happens every, every week. We don't know the why, Jr. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. You, don't, yeah. you, you never know what the why is there. Um you know, you talk about uh, him going over to Alabama from Georgia, and then Georgia just fills that hole right in with Missouri's best wide receiver. Right. right. 
And so it just it, it ends up – and it's very difficult. I mean, these coaches are – they are – the frust, they're frustrated is an understatement. Yeah, I could only imagine. The recruiting schedule is outrageous. Those guys are never off. And uh, that frustration has really started to be much more publicly vented if you look at social media, which I try to mm. stay the hell away from that, but it's part of my job. So, <laughs> right. Uh, I do, yeah. you know, from a news perspective, have to pay attention. But, um, College football or college athletics in general uh, are in a unique place. And, and you cannot forget that football pays for everything. Right. Yeah. There are some universities that basketball is profitable, some. A handful maybe. But football pays for all. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and, we, and you know, we could get on here all day and talk football because we all love it. But let's change gears a little bit here. And I want to uh, – we'll talk about a few things before we get into to what I, what I want to talk to you about music because we hadn't got to really catch up. We've sent some texts lately. But I know um, uh, Tiggs and I have our, have our uh, abilities and attributes, but there's something that you guys on the right side of my screen, Blasey and Marty both have is – you guys both participate in some extreme sports. I don't know if, if Blasey or Tiggs know this, but Marty is a world-class cornhole player and actually holds a world Guinness Book of World record for tossing oh, wow. cornhole. I did not know that. that. That's right. awesome. It's not nearly wow. as impressive as JR makes it sound. However, I appreciate <laughs> you. Uh, last year, uh, my, I have a show called Marty and McGee that I do with, with my, my buddy Ryan McGee on the SEC Network, and we lead into in the fall we lead into sec nation which is college game day for the sec and my our coordinating producer the guy that oversees those shows on the road baron miller had this idea he was like i want to break a guinness book of world record live on the air and we're going to do it longest cornhole throw so i, I love this idea so <laughs> we fly this dude in from london who's what's called an adjudicator. He's the guy who says it's legit or not. You either, like, I'm confirming that you are a world record holder or not. And so we fly this dude in, pay him a bunch of money. It ain't cheap. And he comes in, <laughs> all right, and we have these cornhole boards 76 feet apart, I think, or 77, something like that. And Which normal is 27 feet, correct? Yes, that's correct. So Big toss, big toss. 10 to 12 Eastern time. It was, it was Georgia hosting Tennessee was when we did it. Mid-October, I think. And uh, 10 to 12 was the, the allotted time that we have had to pull this off. So, I did this big feature that week on Jaden Daniels, LSU's quarterback. Phenomenal kid, by the way. And so, I, I, we, we call it lead and tag. I... When you when you do a big feature like that for College Game Day or for SEC Nation, you le you 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 you're on live, and you introduce the piece, and then the piece runs on tape, and then you're live out of the piece. And so I did that. When that was over, it was like eleven forty, Eastern Time. I'm done for the day. I'm looking at my watch, going, "By God, I got twenty minutes to break this damn world record. I'm gonna go do it. I'm gonna throw these bags till that sucker goes in." All right. So I had already thrown six bags before that. And Barron had told us that he'd been practicing for months. And he told us the best way to throw the bag was vertically, okay, perpendicular to the ground. Okay. So we'd all been throwing them that way. So I step in there, and we had these pros, these American Cornhole League guys were there with us, also trying to break the record. And... One of them looked at me. I threw the first bag, and he looked at me. He's like, why are you throwing it like that? I'm like, I don't know. Boss told me to. He goes, how do you throw a cornhole bag? I'm like, like this. He goes, throw it like that. I ain't even lying to y'all. Air mail. Thunk straight in the damn hole. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my ever-loving mind. I, oh, I, went, yes. I went bonkers. I'm running around like I won the damn Super Bowl. Like Steph Curry hit the hole in one. Seriously, right. I mean, losing my mind. Poor Jordan Rogers, my coworker, 
he jumped off the set and ran over to me. It was probably a 20-yard, 30-yard <laughs> run. Picks me up, and I'm like pumping my fist in the air. I elbowed him right between the eyes, damn near knocked him out. <laughs> and, and it was funny, afterwards, Laura Rutledge, the unbelievably talented uh, host of SEC Nation, Laura goes, Marty's broken this world record. Marty, how does it feel? And I said, Laura, I got to be honest with you. I'm a, I'm a father of three wonderful children whom I love so much. I've been married for 23 years to the greatest person I've ever known, my wife, Lainey. But the greatest moment of my life is winning the Redneck Olympics. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, I mean, just like it's, it's it crazy. And, but, Jr., I don't know if you know. Do you know about the big controversy? Oh, no, I hadn't heard. All right, so there was big controversy in the aftermath. They had to go to the replay. Because I had on white Air jo- triple white Air Jordan 1s, low tops. I stepped on the white line, okay? There's a white line. There's like the line you can't step over. So I'm on this line, and I throw this bag. I run around like an idiot, heathen. And they, like, go to the tape, and this adjudicator, Will, he has to confirm whether or not it was legal. So, ultimately, he says, yes, I was fine. I wasn't over the line. Great. We celebrate. I have this plaque, world record. Well, (laughs) then, all these people, especially there's an old boy down there in Arkansas, probably down there in Poen somewhere. (laughs) He takes to Twitter on this crusade that it's not legal because my (laughs) arm and hand went over the line. Yeah, my Lord. Oh, that's legal. Oh my God! I mean, dude, you it, like it was really, it was really kind of humorous. Uh, I can imagine. <laughs> but you know, by God, by so, God. Yeah. But that so was Justin. You, that was Justin's cousin. <laughs> he probably was. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So you still officially have the record, right? So it is. You know, I don't know, out. brother. I I heard that somebody broke it somewhere. Uh, so I don't know if I still own it, but. But I do you held know it this. At one point. Yeah. Because of the way the calendar works, our record is going to be in, I think, the 2024 or maybe uh, it's either the 23 or 24 Guinness Book of World's Records will be in. Oh, That's man. Because That's of the awesome. way, it wasn't broken before the, ours made it into the book. Make sense? The, okay. The, yes, yeah, the deadline for qualification time right. period, and that, that year's book, you'll get it. So, well, allegedly, we're going to be in that book. But, by God, I got, a pl- I got an official plaque that they sent from London. That is awesome. That has this stamp on it, has my name on it. So, uh, they, I'm going to hey, they, they, uh, they can't take that away from you, Marty. I'm going to box mean, it up on. and ship it down to Arkansas. Yeah, send it to Man. that guy. Yeah, there send you go. Send it to him. I'm hey, kid, out. growing up, you, you always wanted to be in the Guinness World Book of Records. Try to come up with something to get in that book. I'd get that book every year and go through it. You know, what can Isn't I do, Isn't it fascinating? Man? Some of the things that people do. I think it's great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know great. random things. I know at one time um, – uh, Angelo Poffo, who was the father of the Macho Man Randy Savage and uh, Leaping Lanny Poffo, uh, he was the world record holder in sit-ups. I think he, I think what Angelo could do like, I think That's he did like decent. five thousand sit-ups in a row or something crazy like that. It was something like I don't know, forty-eight hours worth of sit-ups or something like that back in the in the late sixties. <laughs> I think he was in there. Uh, How many sit-ups is, could y'all three do? <laughs> I cannot do sit ups. Sit ups are not many. my are, are not my jam, man. Like that, that hurts. Yeah, that DDP hurts. says traditional sit ups are not good for my back and my core, so I have to do some alternative stuff these days. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and, and, and we had we actually had Dallas on a few weeks ago. We were talking about strength and stuff, and that's why I was bringing up the. Uh, uh, the alternative sport and in, in the in the world record because Blasey, I don't know if we've even talked about that on the show, but some years back Blasey used to do long drive competition uh, I did. for for I golf, did. and and I remember you talking to our friends on our I don't know if it was a text thread back then or whatever, and you would send us these numbers of stuff you were doing, and we're like, good God, and you're like, yeah, but you ought to see these other guys with these. Well, I was the tiniest cat out there, man. You know these monsters I'm around and legends and long drive and. Here come my little butt walking up, you know, with a standard stock ping driver. And they're looking at me like I'm a fool. And then I'm sitting, I'm hitting it out there with them. There's, you know, most of the time they're still getting me by 10 or 12 yards. But they they were more amazed that I could do that with my frame and that 
normal club and they've got these at the time like 52 and 55 inch shafts <laughs> and i couldn't even hold those things up you know so how no, that was a lot of fun man what what would you say is the number one most important aspect of driving a golf ball i think it's i think it's flexibility because you it look is. at these guys like will zalatoris and justin thomas who if they don't eat a cheeseburger they're gonna fall through their butt <laughs> and they hit it is. 400 yards yeah it is no it is man it's you know it's creating that torque like you said and that flexibility helps to allow to do that and and creating that torque and timing is everything you know what i mean so you do any of these moves one ahead of the other you get garbage you know but you get that timing and you build and you create that torque where they get that big shoulder turn and everything stays here and it's like that's like the old screen doors you grew up with you know you turn one one way one the other then you let it go there's a massive explosion that right. takes place there so y'all will love his story i just I, i'm not uh distracted i'm looking in my phone for a picture i uh so every spring i go down and play in coach saban's golf tournament t-town all right i am just starting to play golf i've played like 30 rounds in my life okay i was an athlete through college i then joined the you know redneck softball circuit and started doing a bunch of endurance a bunch of marathons and triathlons okay that was my athletic path well now i'm into pickleball and golf because i'm old and gray so <laughs> i love the sport like i am infatuated with golf so i, I suck like if i shoot a hundred i'm pumped okay Hell so yeah. i go down to coach's tournament and I'm confident this time. I've never been confident before. I'm confident that I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna hit fairways and contribute to this scramble. Well, they've stashed me with coaches' golf buddies. One of whom is G Mac, Greg McElroy's daddy, uh, father-in-law. Excuse me. So we start on 15, and we're all, you know, getting ready to. We're small talking. I don't know these guys. They're like, Marty, won't you lead us off? I'm like, I don't really want to lead us off. I want somebody else to lead us off. Up the damn cart path comes a golf cart, and it's at, it's Coach Saban in his, you know, damn basket hat that he wears during <laughs> during camp. And he gets out, and he's like, ah! He's like, lead him off. I'm like, Coach, I don't want to. He goes, get up there. I'm like, all right. <laughs> yes, sir. So, yes, by sir. God, I get up there. All right, I got a five iron. I'm trying to play this safe. I'm like, all right, just get it in the fair. Just hit it out in the fairway. Everything's fine. Boys, I hit this thing. I bet I hit this five iron. 215. And 200 of it was dead ass right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Coach, like, he's, like, disappointed in me. He just puts his head down. Like, and I'm like, God, what happened? Why? <laughs> Why? So, he's all here. these other guys I'm playing with are, like, super good players. Okay. They all hit it out there. So, Coach's role in this tournament, you know, the, the celebrity, they hit, like, ceremonial tee shots with all the groupings. So, Coach steps up there. And I'm like, please, Lord, let him hit this thing right in the water. Like, just, Shank it. <laughs> he duck hooks this thing dead left into the wilderness. And I'm like, nice. Yes. So, Off he had said to me after – my drive he's like next time we're on tv together don't you think this ain't coming up <laughs> so he duck hooks this thing left into the wilderness and i'm like i hope you bring it up <laughs> <laughs> yes, here's sir. what i didn't know what i didn't know was that coach saban was hitting autographed golf balls he had si he signs the golf ball that he ceremonially hits and whomever grabs it first gets to keep this Nick Saban golf ball. I didn't know this. Well, I am I go to my ball, which, or, oh, well, that's a lie. I go drop, and I'm standing <laughs> over my ball, and I'm like, well, we ain't going to hit my ball. So, like, I'm going to go up to, I can't find any of my teammates. Like, where did my teammates go? They're all over in the woods scurrying around. I have no idea why. They come out of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> and they hand me that all right i ha i have this in my backpack 
for the sole purpose that if Nick Saban ever brings this up on TV, I'm going to go, remember this? Oh, yeah. I've never told that story. That's the first time I've ever told that story. Drop it exclusives here on the Tig Spitz podcast. That's great. Well, hey, there you go. You got the proof uh, if it ever comes up. That's awesome. Uh, You know, you mentioned a minute ago, Marty, when you said your sports these days that us us, uh, middle-aged guys like to play. You brought up pickleball, and I wanted to get to that because I know you've been playing a bunch. And it seems like everybody in the country and probably the world has been playing a lot of pickleball lately. I was watching a video this morning of literally Drew Brees – in a doubles match against John McEnroe and somebody, and Drew got him. I thought John was going to take a swing. Uh, and I know, and I know, talking about our, our 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 friends and family there in Arkansas, Justin Moore's dad, Mr. Ray, has been trying to get me and Justin to play with him every time I go to Arkansas. And I'm like, I don't even play tennis, Mr. Ray. I don't. You don't I've have tried to. Once or tw- twice. You don't That's have what to. he says. Big, he just, big ping pong. You're like, it? yeah, you're like, you're like, Mr. Ray. You just want to get me out there so you can spank us like he does me and Justin. But, <laughs> but I've noticed this thing has taken off, and we know we watched it when with the last thing we were talking about cornhole because cornhole was a backyard little game that people were playing up until I don't know 10, 12 years ago. It took off like a wild banshee and has now got its own league it's got its own endorsements it's got tv its own TV, deal. Like tv deal i mean like all it's, that stuff it's an enterprise it, it really is and pickleball seems to be right there with it if not nudging ahead these days what do you think the um the big draw is to pickleball one and two how far do you think this thing will go you think it's going to get to where it's i mean obviously it probably won't make it to wimbledon level because that's such a historic i think it'll be an and, olympic sport one day you think so oh wow well. I could see that. I could yeah. see that. The reason that it's so popular is the community. Uh, we were just talking about golf. What makes golf so awesome is the community. It's being out there with your buddies, and it's it's golf is a game that if you just don't hurt yourself, you're going to have an opportunity to score. Right. Pickleball is the most self-inflicted error game I've ever played. And the community is beautiful. If you, I say this often, I was introduced to the game about five or six years ago. I've been playing it for a lot longer than it had. Like, it, it did explode in the last two, two and a half. Um, maybe three. I don't know what that time window is. But I played it before that. And... I fell in love with it because at my summer place, I have a summer place in uh, in South Jersey on the shore down there. My wife's hometown is Ocean City, New Jersey. And we bought a house there eight years ago, spend our summers there. And I started playing almost every morning because her aunt and uncle, who are our parents' generation, I'll right. say that. There you go. Um, who are in our parents' generation, play every day. And they were begging my brother-in-law, Mike, and I to come out there and compete. I am addicted. And I'm going to tell you this, JR, by God. I don't care how athletic you are. I don't care how athletic you think you are. You walk out on a pickleball court and you don't know what you're doing, you think you can out-athletic people, there's going to be an 82-year-old lady with a damn knee brace and a bedazzled poker visor, walk out there on that court and whip <laughs> your ass. <laughs> because they know how to place it. Yep. And, like, it's there's, there's so much strategy involved in pickleball that you have to play to know. And it was funny. The last time I played this summer was right before I came back. Laney and I, we, t- we go up there as a family after our girls are done dance. Uh, in the spring, and we stay until two or three days before they go back to high school, go back to school. And last time I played was like, I don't know, 10 days ago against my brother-in-law, and he was like, you SOB, you know every single, you know where I'm going to hit it before I hit it. And that's only because he and I have played with and against each other so much. It's almost like, it's almost like, quarterbacks diagnosing what the defense wants to do to them post-snap before it happens. You just you can see it unfolding in 3D before it unfolds. And, <laughs> man, vision. it's fun. So, and I, 
I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I was just going to say, I, we've got courts in our neighborhood, man. I guarantee you right now they are full. They, every morning oh. I leave and go out of here, they're playing. I've played a handful of If I of wasn't time, on here with awesome. you jokers, by God, that's where I'd be. That's where I'd be. <laughs> Eat up with it, son. Yeah. That's so what I get I'm it. talking about. I get it. I well, need that, to play more of it, though. Yeah, well, and and that and that scenario you that you, uh, you alluded to there is exactly what happened to our buddy, Mr. Justin Moore, when he did go play with his dad. His dad finally talked him into going to a little pickleball tournament with no him chance. over at Malvern. So Justin's on the way over there. He's like, all right, I'll go, but I only want to play with you. And, uh, you know, I don't want to be around no, no shooters. They're going to be, you know, I just want to take it easy. But, but Justin's an athlete, so he thinks he's just going to go whoop all these old people, you know. It's like so he dog. gets over there. He <laughs> plays the first one with his dad. He's not very good, so his dad gets mad, don't want to play with him anymore. So it's <laughs> himself. I've been there. And then I'm literally, like, like you said, like some 75-year-old lady with knee braces on <laughs> destroys him and is getting yeah. on to him because he's not playing right. He's like, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm, I'm new to this game. The thing, too, <laughs> is, though, JM's so competitive. I bet I it know. ate his ass. <laughs> That's it. That's the only time he went. He won't go back. He hates it. He talks smack about it. He doesn't like the sport now. And he's, he says, it's not a real sport. If an 80-year-old woman could beat That's me. That's a lie. He is wrong. <laughs> so, and I'll so tell you I what, see. though. It's a, another way it's a lot like golf is – Especially if you're a baseball player, like JM, like me. Yeah. Like you think you can walk out on the golf course and athlete your way through it. Right. Uh-uh, Jack. No yeah. shot. I mean, yeah. it's almost I, it's almost worse. Yeah, it's almost counterintuitive can. because you really need – you can't go out there with that strength and aggression thing. No, you really mm -mm. have to poise. And that and finish position. is different too, you know, instead the of staying back. The finish is so different, man. Yeah. you got – you got to get your hips through. Yeah. And you also, another thing I've noticed that is, that is so counterintuitive to baseball is, like, okay, you, in, in, in baseball, all right, you want to go shoulder to shoulder. All right, if you're hitting a baseball, if you're hitting it right, your eyes on the ball and you want to go shoulder to shoulder. All right. That's the same way in golf, but the because the because the motion is so different. That's one thing I'm still battling. My, I mean, I hit at least fifty percent of my golf shots. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the damn moon, oh, yeah. and where's the damn golf ball? Who knows where the golf ball goes? I just, right. I don't know. Yeah, I, it's, I it's tough. It's tough. I mean, in golf and and one concept to really gain early is you know the swing is right it starts down here it's to the top in your backswing and it's your finishing point like you really got to focus on here and here and you just happen to hit a golf ball in the middle of that yeah like a lot of people think the swing is to the ball and after that doesn't matter no 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 you're just happen to you hit a ball through that process and you want to finish to that finishing point and you can really work on getting to that finishing point you'll eventually start hitting the ball but you got to yeah. commit to that, you know. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. It's it's like the, that backswing's like popping you, leave, popping your wrist at the end of a jumper. You, I mean, you can try other stuff and where your hand ends at the end of a jumper, but there, you watch Michael Jordan, watch yeah. Tiger Woods, you're gonna see where 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 the finish it, it actually does make mean a lot to it. Well, we'll yep. get off sports because I know Marty's got to go talk about it on 36 other podcasts and, and <laughs> TV shows and, uh, and books and everything else throughout the rest of the week. But I wanted to talk quickly uh, with you, uh, Marty, about a little music because I know that's one of our passions. I know it's one, one of yours as long as it has been mine, and we talk about music on here a lot. Uh, I know we texted a few weeks ago because I had uh, told the story on here or, or, or on uh, Justin's podcast about me going to see Hank Jr. and – told the story about how you know I, I cried for the first six songs and and I, and when I, when you sent it you you sent the message to me I said Marty you know exactly what I'm I talking do. about because I know how passionate about music you are and when it sat in there was nothing I could do but just stand there and smile grin ear to ear and cry and I wasn't even drunk or anything it was so <laughs> good I love that, that I just, feeling man I couldn't That's a stand good feeling. it you know, and yeah. and I was just thinking, my wife got to go see one of our buddies and one of your dear friends, uh, Mr. Eric Church, the chief, uh, this past weekend. He played three nights down here in Orange well, Beach sure. at the Wharf. Yep, yep. and a uh, bunch of friends and family. And I caught up with Todd and, and Marshall and, and Brandon and that bunch, and they hooked me up with some tickets uh, for some friends and family. Of course, we were somewhere else in America working, so I didn't get to go. But 
going to those concerts now after the pandemic's finally let back up, I know we've talked about it a little bit here and there, but, man, does it feel good to be back to normal. People going to live concerts, places full, no mask, everybody drinking, hugging, singing along the songs. You know, besides winning a championship that you or, or, or a ball game or a sport or an event where you get to directly contribute to the outcome, is there anything more gratifying than going to a concert experience when you can be with a bunch of people in unison in love with the music that someone's putting out? No, there's not. Not for me. Not for yeah. my wife. It is we're made to gather. Human beings are made to gather. And to be immersed in the same energy together, whether that's church, whether that's, you know, if you're a spiritual person, Um, for me, I love nothing more than the experience of being immersed in that energy exchange between the artist and the consumer. And when all the consumers are pulling in the same direction, which these days is very rare, Mm -hmm. it's a very beautiful thing. And, you know, you talk about Eric, I mean, JR, I'll tell you guys, Justin's been a friend of mine for 15 plus years. Um, I found Justin really, really early on when, you know, he was singing Hank It and he was singing, uh, you know, Small Town USA and, and that first record when the, on the cover he looks like literally he's 12 years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mullet and all. And, you know, he's, he's singing songs that I felt, Justin's younger than me, and and I remember hearing that first record and being like, okay, I don't know where this guy's from, but I know he's from a place like Parisburg. I know he's from Mm -hmm. a place like the town that I grew up in out in Appalachia in the southwest part of Virginia. And then once I met him, I mean, it took us about 42 seconds to be soul brothers. Right. But (laughs) you you talk about church and the talent. I mean, I was just – my wife and I were, were enjoying our weekend this past weekend, and I had back-to-back songs that came on my kind of summer playlist. I had Quitting Time by Morgan Wallen and My Song Will Never Die by Luke Combs. Chief wrote both of those songs and gave them away to his buddies. Yep. I mean, you wow. you got to think about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you're a singer-songwriter... You don't give away songs that you feel like are your best stuff. So what's that son of a gun got in his back pocket? No joke. You know what I mean? So, like, I remember during COVID, very, very vividly during COVID, that if I didn't have music, if I didn't have the release that came with that, I don't know what I would have done emotionally. I was very intentional during that time about doing my best to stay out of this thing. Mm -hmm. I tried to read a book every 10 days, so I wasn't in my phone. I tried to be very intentional about my time with Lainey and very intentional about my time with Cameron, Mia, and Vivian, not only collectively but individually, because it was the first time in my adult life that I was home. All I've ever done is travel. Yep, right. And so all of that unfolding amid this concern that what if the world doesn't come back so i'd have a few pops and i'd put on some some music and i'll never forget one day text message comes through and it's church and there's a you know mp4 attached to the text and that's one of my favorite things in the world when my buddies send me songs early because you feel like you're part of something that most people don't get to be yeah, you are. And yeah. the song yeah, was Hell of a View. Oh, wow. wow. And this was a year, I guess, before it actually went to market. And that song will forever be so special to me. And what a song. And what a poignant song for that time, too. Yeah. yeah. And absolutely. you need it. And then here he gets, he, your buddy sends you this song, Hell of a View. I mean, what a perfect song. What it says. Time- and, and I know. why it says it, and we're we're different than most. Yep. You know, we may not we may not be what that person needs, but by God, we're what each other needs. 
Yeah. You're you right. and me, together. And no matter yep. what the view is, together, it's a hell of a view. And that is such a special, beautiful message. And, I mean, that, the Sunday when we were out here messing around on the lake and at the pool and whatnot, I took a screen grab. Church is so tired. Just every one of my buddies are so tired of my damn buzzed screen grab text. <laughs> this song's awesome, man. <laughs> but, Hell, I do it too. You know, church, hey. Eric saved my life, man. I mean, he saved my life. When, when my dad died, I did not know Eric yet. Uh, and and that first record centers like me provided the perfect vehicle to carry my emotions within that sorrow. And you know, when you lose your dad, I hope all three of y'all still have your dads. I don't know your your personal stories, but I don't. Whether whether your dad is your best friend, whether he's your hero, whether you you want to do everything together, whether y'all don't get along, you fight. Maybe you don't have that close a relationship. Your father is a compass. No matter what that relationship is, and when you lose him, that compass is just spinning. It's wayward. And you don't know where to point your rudder. And I was lost, man. And Eric's talent gave me a North Star. And wow. when I got the opportunity to tell him that, uh, it was an interesting time because he was playing a show. This was after he got flyered, uh, fired from the Flats tour mm -hmm. and was playing clubs. And he was playing this little old honky-tonk in Greensboro, North Carolina, called Arizona Pete's. And my buddy got tickets. And back then, every ticket was a meet and greet. J.R. knows these those days. Oh, yeah. You get a ticket, you get to meet the artist. Oh, yeah. And there was no backstage. The club was so small. There was on stage and behind the bit venue. At the merch so his booth. Meet and greet, yeah, his meet and greet was on his bus. And so wow. it's December 22nd. It's three days before Christmas. And there's a line of people standing outside his bus, cold as all hell. And I'm having this back and forth. Do I tell this man what he means to me? Or do I hedge for fear he's going to think I'm a stalker? <laughs> yeah. And I wasn't going to do it because I knew it would be weird. But the more Jack Daniels I had and the further up I got in line, I said, I'm never going to see this dude again. I'm telling him. I didn't have the balls to look him in the eye. I stuck my hand out, and I said, hey, man, I just want you to know something. It's going to be weird. You saved my life. I lost my daddy this year, and I needed something to hold on to. And that record offered me that tow rope. And I know that – you are so much better than what you're playing right now. I know that you know that you are so much more talented than playing these little sewers. But I want you to remember this. Every single night, there is at least one person in there that desperately needs your energy and your spirit and that exchange. And tonight is me. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And That's huge. That's powerful, man. No doubt. We've been like that ever since <clears throat> i mean that's I mean, the ultimate compliment that you could pay an artist or anybody i mean that's just a person that's being a person that's a one-on-one yeah. -on -one thing it, that came from your heart which is what you are marty you're very authentic that that comes oh, across you. on tv and everything else you speak from the heart you can't hide it you're not able to hide that and i love that about you and i know that he loved that about you too hearing that because i can only imagine being on that end of what that guy was going through at that time to hear that message he needed that too you know well, and jr knows i mean you can describe it right now what when, when when you're in that portion of a career like you were with party all right it's 230 nights a year on a bus with the band, by the way, and or, the road or, guy, or, by or the way. Or a van and a trailer. Or a van. <laughs> and you're sleeping underneath the seats. Yep. And you're going town to town, and it's exhausting. I don't care who you are. Yeah. And you can completely lose sight of why you love it. And I, I know now, because I've, I've been kind of been around that industry enough now to have had these conversations with some people. Like, that is an injection of life into the artist and the band mm. 
that is, I think, rare because most meet and greets are, hey, nice to meet you, smile for the camera, move along as fast as you possibly can. Right. It's not that you don't appreciate the fans because you love the fans, but that doesn't make it easy. No. no. Yeah, well, like you said, you know, back and, and going back then, yeah, I can remember being with John when he was first on his way up, and I knew he was going to be a big old star because the same thing, like you said, I remember the first time going into a little rehearsal space in someone's basement in East Nashville, and they were doing a rehearsal, him and Terry and Lee and Howie, our old drummers, actually our old drummer Howie's basement, and I stepped in while they were rehearsing for about three songs, and I said, this guy's Alan Jackson if he wants it. If nothing gets in his way, this guy's Alan Jackson or you know a, a career like that and um and we went out on the road and nobody knew who he was we could you know we're on these tours we ain't got a song on the radio we're out opening for church and 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 you know rockford illinois at some big theater and we're in the van and i've got the van and trailer the little white ford uh e320 you know conversion or van, 12 passenger <laughs> van parked between five of church's tour big old tour buses <laughs> right. you know what i mean and 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 you know we just drove there from playing some crappy club at, you know in, in indiana you know where we had to stop at the gas station and get some you know chips and salsa because that was the only thing that felt like a meal because you got to mix two things together so that was like a delicacy <laughs> on the road and, and then and and get there and you know have a meet and greet and only have like three people show up, you know, and it's a little disappointing, but one of the three is a little boy who's dressed just like John mm. and has got on his shirt, I want a party, you know, and it's it. like that's the, you don't need but three. If one of them's dressed like – if one of them's that kid, you don't need but three if one of them's Marty Smith telling you how you changed his life. And that artist only needs that one person to give them that energy because they can juice. play for that one person. Yeah. And, you know, one of, one of our heroes that we've talked about over the years, Marty, was Charlie Daniels. And I love Uncle Charlie saying about – Never look at the empty seats because that's not seats. that's not who that's not who we're here to play for. We're here to play for the we here to work for these people who did buy seats. They got a babysitter that filled up their car with gas, bought a motel room, paid twenty dollars for parking and ten dollars a beer. That's who we're playing the show for. And uh, yeah. as long as that interaction is still there, I I don't I think with all these distractions from social media and the TikTok age and all the things we're going through, because guys, we've seen a lot. I mean, we you know we remember as kids eight tracks in cars to now you know you got an earbud in with the world in your ear um that that that's never going to change you know that that music and the interaction between uh, listeners and 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 artists because they're making the soundtrack to our lives you know and you pull from that universe of music to create your playlist and your soundtrack for your life you know i can remember those same things you know we'd have you get to the show you have you have the big high from doing the show because we drove all day and it's like yeah the, there was, it was a packed bar it was awesome minneapolis all right we're going down the next one and then an hour down the road all that energy goes away you know and then it starts sinking in it's like boy i'm tired boy my shoulder hurts my back hurts man this van stinks i wish terry quit farting you know <laughs> and uh and then a robert earl Keane song would come on so I'm coming home, you know, or, yep. you know, what I really mean or something like that. Or a Greg Allman song comes on the radio, you know, multicolored lady or something like that. And it's just like it takes all that weight off of you and sinks you back into down to your to your to your level of your soundtrack to where you're. Nope, I'm in the right spot. This is the part of the movie where this happens. We'll get back up on the high horse tomorrow on it. But you got to make it through the downs to wait on the ups because they are worth waiting on. You know what I mean? Right. And I think music, if if you blend it right, and I know there's some people who don't like music. Same with some people who don't like sports. You know, and it, there's that's some people like sweet tea, some people like unsweet tea. God bless. But I just I, I know right. I don't know how you go without music though. I, I mean, I, music yeah. literally. It, if you say there's like no, no such thing as magic on this earth, I, I disagree with you wholeheartedly because music is magic, and it's the closest thing to magic that I've ever seen. It how it makes you feel, and like you said, the community you get people together and what you experience. Dude, it's unbelievable. It's just it's the greatest mm -hmm. feeling that you can get, you know. So you, you go to a show, you go to a JM show, and he sings If Heaven Wasn't So Far Away. And there's ten thousand people, twelve, fifteen thousand people, twenty five at a big amphitheater in the summer, whatever. Mm -hmm. All of them got their phone out. And they're waving that phone. You tell me that's not spiritual? Yep. Oh, yeah, you tell absolutely. me that's not being transported 
to somewhere that only that energy can take you. I mean, it's church. It is a spiritual is. thing that makes you consider the deepest, most vulnerable pieces of yourself that you may yeah. not consider every day. And the beauty of music to me is the great ones make me consider those pieces of myself that maybe I'm too scared to admit to myself or maybe I'm not strong enough to admit to myself and I then consider that and maybe I'll make change or maybe it will empower me to address that piece of myself. Yep. And, or let, and let you know you're not the only one going through this. You're not alone. Not That's alone. Right. I, love, yep. I love the journey that you go through. You know, you go to a great show and I get done. It's the journey of emotions that I experienced throughout that night. It's like nowhere else on earth could I have gone through that experience than being right there where I was at this time, this moment in time, you know. So I got so so two things real quick. I got a new book coming out very soon called yeah, Sideline yeah. CEO. All right. Yeah. I interviewed all of these championship coaches. Uh Urban Meyer, Mac Brown, Saban, Dabo Sweeney, Roy Williams, John Calipari, Jimbo Fisher, Kirby Smart, Kim Mulkey, Patty Gasso, on and on and on. Okay? Doc Rivers, all these champions. And at the very end of that book, I felt so like I, I couldn't figure out the best way to tie it up because at the end of the book, being an LSU guy, Tiggs, you'll love this. When I first started thinking of this book, I happened to run into Dale Brown. I was down in, in BTR broadcasting Kentucky at LSU basketball. Coach Brown walked over, wanted to in, introduce me to an actor buddy of his that was at the game with him. So I meet the actor guy, and I said, Coach, I got this idea, man. I want to do this book. I got a title called Sideline CEO. That title is dope. Yeah, it I is. I mean, that <laughs> title is on fire, man. Yes, sir. And Coach goes, I can see it already. He goes, Text me your email. I'm going to send you something in a couple of days. So Coach Brown emails me all of his correspondence with John Wooden over 38 years. Oh, what? my God. Wow. All right. Holy so that's cow, the end of the man. book. Oh. This book, look, y'all, I mean, it's the insight in it. Now, I'm a, I am a total – I am one of those guys who is fearless in the way – of I am going to go do me and there's a lot of people who don't like people like that Nick Saban says in the book mediocre people don't like high achievers and high achievers don't like mediocre people <laughs> think about that because yeah. people who are not willing to dig and claw and work and find and beat themselves to death to find the best version often mock those people. Why? Because they're trying to fill up something that ain't in there. You're right. Absolutely right. And people who are willing to be that person, who will exhaust themselves in, what does Saban always say? Process over outcome. Brian the Kelly, the, the reason that Jaden Daniels had the, the, the season he had last year in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, is Brian Kelly saying to him, I don't want perfection, son. I want excellence. And excellence comes every single day by doing what you're supposed to do the best you can do it. Yep. All right? That's it. Now, how do I wrap this up? And the only way that I could think to do it was, I'm giving away the end of my book, but whatever. I love you. <laughs> it goes back to that song. My song will never die. Because any of you listening who've heard that song, if you haven't, go seek it out right now. Luke Combs, My Song Will Never Die. It says, basically, I won't be here forever, but my song will. Mm. Long after I'm gone, my song's going to be here. And long after these coaches pass, long after I'm gone, I'm me. I don't like speaking in the third person. Me. <laughs> The principles that are in this book and the vulnerability from these individuals that's in this book will be forever. And so there's that. Now, back to music. <laughs> Another book I want to write, and y'all will love this. I would love to write a book on the class of 89. 
Oh. Alan Jackson, Travis Tritt. Oh. Clint Black. Dude, you you, you oh, have Brooke. to write this book, Marty. You have to. Mary- I've listened to hundreds of hours of your podcast and you talking about music and Waylon and all those guys. Oh Love God, yeah, Waylon. you've got to do th- you've got to do this, Marty. That's yeah, when that's I started. Sorry, I got excited. <laughs> exact same time frame as when I got into country. Even growing up in the South, I wasn't that into it. I'd hear I'd hear it. It was okay. And that everything you just mentioned right there is what brought me into country music. Absolutely. And who was the uh, – wasn't it uh, Mary Chapin Carpenter? Wasn't she in that class? Um, well, she – she. I mean, to my knowledge, A.R., you've probably forgotten more about country music than I'll ever know, but to me, the <laughs> quote-unquote class of 89, uh, I think, is those four. Right. Garth, A.J., Clint, Tritt. Okay. Yeah, yeah I think there was I, – I, and I think, I think I'm right on that. I think there's a female con- con- contributor it, to that bunch that they used to – It would be that, her – that the guys, or, when when you bring it up, the guys always say, "Don't forget about her." I think it would be her or Martina or somebody like that. Um, but it wasn't dude, Patty Love. It wasn't Patty, Patty Love, Love. Let's get out of here with Patty yeah, Love. Right. It's all I, know, right. I mean, I, I love that woman. <laughs> I, mean. I, I I want to interview her because, dude, when we could get off on some crazy tangents about saddest country music songs of all time. Patty's got one of them. She's got a, she's got a bunch of good ones. I mean, in her she's voice, got one of the saddest country. T- what what song? Which what one? If is I it? can help you say goodbye. What's that song called? Uh, um, I'm gonna listen to it after she's we got a couple. all this up today. I'm going Hold down on. a rabbit hole of country today. That's gonna hold on. I, I'll sure have it right happen. here in just a second. Hey, it, and, and they weren't the class of 89, but uh, I can tell you one, Marty, because I wanted to ask you about who you've seen lately. And anybody How Can I Help You Say Goodbye? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah songs yeah. called How Can I Help You. It's that one where she's like the basic, the basic premise of the song is uh, I sat on our bed. He packed his suitcase. I held a picture of our wedding day. His hands were trembling. We both were crying. He kissed me gently and walked away. I called up Mama. Mama's in the song. Of course, Mama's in the song. I called up Mama. She said, time will ease your pain. Life's about changing. Nothing ever stays the same. How can I help you? I mean, dude, come on. Mm. Strong. I mean. Strong. And that that whole era. Doug Stone. Come and on, we Doug see Stone, it now. Never knew oh, yeah. Doug. Better off Doug in a Stone pine box. Get out of here. Pine uh, box, man. Two months ago, I went and saw him down, down here in Destin. Doug man, Stone? Awesome. Yes, I did. It Let's great. go. We can party uh, together, son. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I tell you who I saw last. We got we got we did some shows last weekend up in Minnesota, um, and two of them on the on the festival bill with us were um, one I'd seen recently, Sawyer Brown, which is oh. Mark and Hobby. Those guys. I mean, they still rocking. And um, speaking of after, saddest after, country songs ever, the walk. Yeah, oh, come on! Yeah, <laughs> give oh, yeah. me. Down you make the does the driveway. What a stud! Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and the other one on that bill that night, well, I, I hadn't forgot about him. It's just I hadn't done a show with him ever. I don't think until the other night was Blackhawk. Oh, God, and, dude! I, why didn't y'all tell me you were playing I, with all of them? I'd have came down there. Well, that's no what just where was league. it? This was in like some uh, Hinkley, Minnesota, randomly state fair up in Hinkley, Minnesota. Fair so Festival wait a minute time. now. It's Black Hawk, Sawyer Brown, y'all. <laughs> and just yeah, and and that I'm was, trying to think. that's it. That's the bill. Well, no, there's two other acts before that. Uh, oh gosh, and I'm I'm drawing a blank now. It was it was another. We'll edit it out. Couple, Don't worry about it. Right, um. right, right. But two other young, two other baby acts, and then and then that bill, yeah. Wow. So we're watch, so just in our side stage watching Black Hawk at I don't know four thirty in the afternoon. I would have been too, right there. And there's yeah. and there's six or seven thousand people out there though, singing every word. Justin goes, look, Chalk they know every word, rain. not just some of them. Mm. I, I mean, mean, they have some hammers. <sighs> Goodbye says yes, it all. Do. Oh yeah, yes. sure can smell the rain. Like the, they are the they one. Are. The one that got me was the one where he's talking about. Uh, I'm not strong enough to say no. Don't do. Don't don't come on to me because <laughs> don't don't try to rekindle this old relationship. Cause I'm not strong it. enough to say no. I'm yep. like, good. How poignant of us. Hey, and another one a few weeks ago, equally as crazy. We did one where the opening band that day at three o'clock was the Bellamy Brothers. 
Why are y'all failing me as friends? <laughs> yeah. There's the bigger question. Old we hippie? Yeah, dude, did they, they play old hippie? You know they did. Good I mean, God. You got to call me, man. I'm a redneck I'm a girl. I mean, too. all of them. Um, who, then Randall King, who is one of my new favorite new guys up and coming. Randall King is a bank. He, he's going he's to make it. Um, Sammy Kershaw. Let's go. Uh, who else? Do you know Bones, Sammy's bus driver? Yes. What a clown. <laughs> I've known him forever and ever, amen. He used to drive NASCAR haulers. Did he really? Yeah, that was oh, his wow. job before he drove Sammy's bus. He's a great dude. That makes sense. Well, uh, that's right. Sammy was doing the roots and boots thing when it's he, Aaron Tippin, and Colin Ray do a three-piece thing where they all share a band and they all go out there at the intro and then they'll peel off and one will do some songs and the other and then they'll come back together. Great show to catch out there if you catch it, Roots and Boots. But anyway, that whole era of music's resurging now through a lot of these artists we're talking about because that was their influence. And I have to explain this to people all the time, and I'm sure you do too, Marty, when people say, well, that ain't country and this is that. And I agree, some stuff should be on – we need to find some way to define our genres to where radio stations play formatted music for what people want to hear. But you can't expect – people making music now the this current generation of hit makers not to use influences that they picked up along their way growing up all everybody did everybody did yeah. johnny Wayland, cash johnny uh, cash cut pop songs man like, that's what i'm yeah. saying and, and and hank senior he he learned from t-top who was a blues right. singer in georgiana yeah. you know so it's like had waylon jennings had r&b heavy rock to listen to it would have been in some of his music at some point so yeah. now the current some of the biggest hit the morgans and the lukes and these guys and the hardys and these guys they're basically and, and eric's been doing it for a while minus maybe some of the hip-hop stuff but they're basically taking all of their influences which is everything because if you're under 50 you've been in you've you've heard hard rock you grew grew up in the 80s and 90s with rock you you know hip-hop and, and rap in that world because it's those two have merged and become a big part of pop culture so you can't expect the new age to only play you know Tradition. waylon yeah. and willie nelson yeah, and yeah. johnny cash songs because they got a lot of other influences but their influences also are the class of 89 and now even that a lot of the influences are eric church and justin moore were their people they were growing right. up listening to in high school along with nelly and you know two live crew and outcast and you know whoever right. else was, right. and, and guns and roses you know bon jovi pantera whatever they were listening to yes um, it's i mean look it's so interesting to me that people want to jump on that this that ain't country horse okay if that's how you feel cool there's plenty of it out there for you yeah look plenty. at what, what is the as we speak right here on august 22nd 2023 at 9 18 central time what is the number one song on the billboard hot 100 it's got to be it your guy from the rich men north of yep. richmond yep yep, yep. yep. All right. that's as country as it gets yep it is okay so like there's plenty of that of it out there. Tyler Childers and Co Wetzel and these boys out there are making that like that type of country music. Yeah. It's out Tra there. If you want, if you yeah. want to go back, back, you know, because I like throwback kind of stuff. Charlie Crockett's been one I've been on since pre-pandemic yeah. since he was. Well, you Sturgill know, played... Simpson. I yeah. mean, Meta Modern Sounds of Country Music is one of the greatest records of Change the game. Records of I, all time. It is. It I is. said it's that. Great. I said that on on another podcast. If a sound that I could wish I could go back and have that experience from the first time I heard yeah. it, and that was here in Sturgill, the first time I heard on WSM so Radio, oh. it, I heard um, um, "Life Ain't Fair" and "The World Is Mean." They were playing on WSM Radio, and I thought, "Is this a is this a ad? What what is this?" If Sturgill heard, had wanted to become a mega star sturgill just didn't want that life right if he had he would be <laughs> because oh because yeah. i mean those those first two records of his were just like hammers yes yeah. every song oh, is a awesome. hammer hammer and yeah. then what happens to a lot of artists is you go they go okay well i gotta make sure that i am following my heart and that it's different and so he cuts uh sailor's guide Yep. which was a just complete different record than the first two. And so it's just like I think about my high school days. Our 
again, if we're all the same age, you guys might be able to relate to this. When we were riding the football games to beat the brakes off of people <laughs> on Friday nights, <laughs> all right, we were listening out not on the team bus because our coach was one of those, it's quiet on here, you think oh, about oh, your yeah. job and you think about representing <laughs> this town, you think about representing your family, you think about building a future for yourself. He was one of those guys. Oh, yeah. God bless him. I miss. I, I love him. So, anyway, it was – when we're riding to when we're riding to the high school after we've cruised Hardy's on Friday afternoon, it is <laughs> the chronic. Oh, yes. It is nitty gritty dirt band fishing in the dark. It is Larry Gatlin and the Gatlin brothers all the gold. It is doggy style. It <laughs> is I mean uh, like uh, Warren G. Yeah, regulators, oh, yeah. regulators mount up. Yeah, yeah, baby. It is appetite for destruction. Like, we are listening to all of that stuff. Yep. yep. And Tracy Lawrence. And, and T. That's right. exactly what it was like. That's exactly yep. what it was like. Ain't right. Yep. And T. Law. And Tritt yep. is like, Tritt is just the freaking man. I, oh, yeah. Back, back after COVID, I got to go down to Travis's house in Georgia, and I got to spend a day with him on his ranch. And, like, oh, it wow. was open. So he let me ask whatever I want. Like, I was like, dude, I'm a fanboy here. <laughs> this is going to be fullfanboy.com. <laughs> and he was all in. And, man, I got to, like, getting to speak with him about that entire path. Because you talk about soundtracks of your youth. Those guys I just mentioned in that class of 89. And, yep. and, 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 and JR's right. T-Law and Martina and Patty Loveless and all of them are just soundtracks of my my path. And – Another thing about it is, Hank Jr. I of mean, course. If you're, I mean, <laughs> I just pulled up "Country Boy Can't Survive" and was watching the video intently because remember he's riding that barge down to Mississippi. Yep. I, I presume it's the Mississippi. It might be the Cumberland or somewhere out near Nashville. I don't know, but he's riding that barge, and the way that they flat go back and watch that video if y'all haven't. They flash all of these like up close facial expressions of people just just random people and the way that they did that video in the mid 80s when was country boy can survive jr 86 yeah probably 87 yeah somewhere in there and it's black and white yeah just super cool man i don't know I, yeah. again i'll shut up y'all get me off on these yeah. music <laughs> no oh, no man, that, no, that, man. That, music well, can go forever on this well that's that's what i wanted to do because I, I know how passionate you are and we are too about music and sports i wanted to just touch on that a little uh you know and and i wanted to say that uh a one i wanted to mention to you have you heard of uh sierra Farrell yet i have not Oh, I check her it. out. She's like a Charlie Crockett throwback, but a female. She's very good voice. I think she's from up there in Virginia, somewhere from where you're from originally, or West Virginia one. Awesome. Um, but I'll that's check a her new out. one. Is there any new uh, acts coming along that you've picked up on lately that um, everybody may not n know about yet that should or will? Um, let me think about it. Um, I got to think about who I've listened to that people may not know about. Because I know it, it, it's so crazy. It happens so fast now. By the time you catch it, used to be you could – like I remember telling people about Chris Stapleton for three years before he did the thing with, with Timberlake uh, and All the right. Charlie Crockett thing and so, but now it goes so fast. That's yeah. another point. Uh, the, so the simple answer to that question is I can't think of anybody right now because, like, I, I was on Childers early. I yep. was on Co early. I was on Whiskey Myers early. But yep. now they're all superstars, so right. they don't oh, count yeah. in this conversation. Troubadours, <laughs> all them, yeah. I had this conversation on the radio show the other day. Um, uh, a co-host, so McGee was not there one morning recently. Uh, so I had a co-host named Matt Jones, who is real big in the state of Kentucky. He has Kentucky Sports Radio, extremely smart, brilliant man, great business mind. And he is Kentucky Wildcat. He's like the de facto Kentucky Wildcats media member. He brought up Fast Car. He's like, man, I don't like it. I'm not sure about it. Like, you know, the, first, the, the original was perfect. And I'm like, okay, all that's fair. The original was perfect. But you got to look at it from a little bit deeper perspective than you are. You got to look at it like this. Luke cutting that song and the success of that song has introduced the original to an entire generation of kids that may not have ever heard of it. 
Right. And not only that, uh, Tracy Chapman is the first African American female to be songwriter of the like the number one songwriter in the format. I think it was June in which she was. Yeah. As a result of the success of that song. So that's super cool. All right. Absolutely. And then on top of that, I had to remind him this way. All right, you're a Kentucky guy. So you're probably a Chris Stapleton guy. If you're not a Chris Stapleton guy, I'm not sure if you're a human American. <laughs> you're right. Anyway, yeah. um, I said, what song launched Chris Stapleton into the stratosphere? Tennessee Whiskey did. Everybody thinks Chris Stapleton wrote Tennessee Whiskey. <laughs> yep. <laughs> George Jones and David Allen co-cut Tennessee Whiskey in 1982. Yep. yep, absolutely. And, and he was like, like, and Dean Dillett wrote it. Dean Dillon wrote it ten years before that in the seventies. Yeah, yep. what's and the same so thing that you get? Like when, go when if you don't know that, and then you learn that, you go, oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Sorry, it's just like, Blazy, go no, ahead. No, it's just like Darius Rutgers did with Wagon Wheel. You know, an old Crow Medicine show, yep. and now yeah. it helped to introduce you know people to them that had never even seen them before it's like no he didn't write that and i talked to so many people like, no it's his song no son that was that was saying years ago you know like and do you know who and that's wrote what that you, song and you and you need people to go back bob, that was a bob dylan Dill- wrote that song yeah that was a bob dylan too wow i didn't know that didn't know that yep. didn't know that so, well and i tell you another one that'll that'll, that'll get you and it was a couple of years ago it was huge remember band of heathens did the song a hurricane yep. Yep. you know that was yep. that was levon helm that was on a 1972 right. called American Son, LeVon Helm song. And, and I always said I like it. Not that I don't like the Band of Heathen song because it's cool. But the LeVon's more of a bluegrassy, swanky, Dixieland jazz version. And I like that. But there's room for both of them to live. And I'm sure LeVon's <laughs> yeah. children and grandchildren didn't mind getting a little royalty bump once that song got put on just, a new album. <laughs> you know, like same with Tracy Springsteen. Chapman. I'm sure Tracy Chapman didn't mind that that nice bump in her no. residuals after that song got yeah. recut again. Uh, and it's yeah. not not a little bump either. No, because that was a solo, <laughs> right, Jr. Right. She wrote solo. it by herself, mm-hmm. and it was the number one song on the Billboard Hot 100. Like, go. What's hap- I'm not going to get off on this tangent. Yeah. I was just going to say, say what's <laughs> happening with country artists being on the Billboard. Like, this is not the Billboard country chart. I'm talking about. This is the yeah. bill. This is the all genre Billboard Hot 100. And right. They hold the top two, right? Right now, I top think three. Is that right? I think top three. It <laughs> might be three, but it might be four. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Because I know it's. I know it's. Rich men north of Richmond. It's yep. last night by Morgan Wallen. It's fast car by Luke, and yep. then it might be another Morgan song. Or Luke, it might be Taylor it Swift though, which is where, and Taylor, yep. uh, you know you. She started as country, but she's she's not that that those huge songs pop. are pop songs, but huge pop, and that yeah. that's a good point there. She started as a country act, now she's the biggest pop, biggest act in the world. Period in the in world, world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. And, and the songs, you know, th- talking about that, you know, you think um, you think Whitney or you think Dolly Parton was mad when Whitney Houston recut her song. You know what I mean? Same scenario, <laughs> no, there. sir. Yeah. You imagine, Bring you know. It, so anyway, I know you got a million things to do, Marty. Uh, before we get out of here, though, I got two quick ones. One, will we see the uh, the um, I don't know what we call it the music sports cowboy outfit from you again this year, like you wore at Coleman Coliseum this past year um, with your number twenty four Alabama basketball jersey, your cut off uh, jorts, and your boots and cowboy hat. Will we get Dude, to see that, that again most- this year? That was the most polarizing thing that's ever happened in my whole career. <laughs> I absolutely love it. I never I knew. I, I, so, so it's interesting that you bring this up because even my own wife was like, dude, the jorts are too much. <laughs> don't, like, don't, don't do the jorts. The haircut thing is enough. Nobody knew. I didn't even get the opportunity to share the backstory on the haircut. There are Spurs fans who there's a there's a barber in town in San Antonio who does that. He cuts the likeness of the players and then dyes like creates depth in the in the in the art with hair dye. And it's super cool. And yep. we were just trying to immerse ourselves in that culture. All right, so there's that. And then even Laney was like, dude, don't do the jorts and boots. Like, don't do that. <laughs> I had no I was like, why? It's funny. Like, who cares? I had no concept that, of the criticism that would come from that. 
Like That's I had great. no concept <laughs> that people would get that mad over now. Now, granted, some people did love it. Like I know I was you loved say, it. You know, right. you know, we oh, all yeah. loved it. You know, know you know, Chief it. and JM and everybody in our world loved it. Oh, yep. that's awesome. And and it was it was interesting because I never want to be. You know, like in the aftermath, I try very hard as a person to take any criticism or any frustration inward now in my adult life rather than get mad i try to use it as a learning tool right and so i'm like okay i i try to i liken it to music dude you don't jr you can't imagine how much i use the education i've gotten from my music friends in my own world because okay i never want to be the guy that chases the number ones i right. want to be the guy that writes from my soul and reports from my soul. So, okay, by wearing the jorts, did I chase the number one? Because it's done 60 million views or something right. like I don't know the numbers, but it's done a lot of it. Like the NBA accounts put it on their social media accounts. So I know all these people have seen it. I mean, it's Halloween oh, yeah. costumes. Uh, right. But that doesn't yeah. mean everybody liked it. <laughs> There's a lot of number one songs I hated. Yeah, true. True, okay? true. So I try to put myself in the seat of the consumer, which I am in music, albeit an educated consumer. And ultimately, it's all come back to, okay, here's the way I view it now. Had I stood there and done a regular report like I would do in my normal life, nobody would even remember it. But because true. I had that much passion, and dressed that way, people are always going to remember. It. <laughs> so you yep. can look at it one of two ways, man. And I, I don't disrespect either way, uh, but I did try to learn from it. But I will tell you, there's a couple guys who said some things about me in the aftermath of that. that I can I only forget. imagine. Well, and you know, <laughs> but you know, it, it's not. It's not like you were you're a, a city slicker from New York City coming down to make fun of cowboys. You know no, what I mean? No, you're right you're a redneck from the Virginia Carolina area. Yeah, we have that right, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. And your friend, you've got friends at home watching you wearing that exact same outfit. Maybe minus <laughs> exactly. the exactly. You know, <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. Like but if you come takes... to one of our concerts, a third of the crowd is dressed exactly. just like that. <laughs> so, exactly. So you're just a man of the people. Bro. But you know, you're just a I could go people. on for days, man. You're, you're I could right, go on for days. Right. and I know. Well, we'll do it. We'll save it for next time, Marty. We'll get you back in yeah. a couple months, do a little recap. Hey, go Marty, ahead, before you go, real quick, I'm in closing here. So for our audience out there that doesn't know you, like the 1%, let's say, that doesn't know who you are, I'd like to give them a little unique perspective on you. And I'd like to do it in your delivery if that's okay. Is that okay with you? All, right. all in. <laughs> all right, here we go. Here's my best. So, Marty, he has the unique ability to construct and deliver a story like no one else. His authenticity is evident when you hear him speak. His words leave you mesmerized. His words leave you tantalized until ultimately you are hypnotized. I refer to this phenomenon as becoming marty -tized. I'll leave you with that, brother. <laughs> it's all true, though. That's what you do to people, man. You yeah, bring them in, man. dude. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's very <laughs> kind. And second, I got to get your number because you should be doing professional VOs in that voice. You can make a hey, lot of money should. on that, son. Well, hey, give him, give him, we'll give him some uh, – hey, ask him in Chad Freeman voice when his book's coming out, Blasey. Yeah. Let's see if we can switch into that one. So, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that you have a book coming out soon, and I really would like to read that. I can't wait to hear your words of wisdom come across there in your voice. Very good. I love it. Uh, yeah, please do go buy it. Uh, you can get it, any book retailer, starting September 26th. Right now, you can pre-order it on Amazon, or if you go to my social media, I am putting a link up. Let's just say... X, Twitter, whatever you call it, you can go to my bio, and I have a link up there where you can get a discounted autographed copy uh, huh. through this one. Yeah, through this one avenue. But September 26th, it's available everywhere. I've signed 
a million already. Um, it's called Sideline CEO Leadership Principles from Championship Coaches. Again, interviewed Coach Saban, Dabo Sweeney, Mac Brown, Urban Meyer, Jimbo Fisher, Roy Williams, John Calipari, Doc Rivers, Kim Mulkey, Patty Gasso, Lane Kiffin, um, Leonard Hamilton down there, uh, Florida State basketball. Um, there are a bunch of them. Oh, Tom Izzo, if I didn't say Coach Izzo. Uh, yeah, all, like wow. just 20 wow. championship Hitters. caliber leaders and uh, broke the book into eight different – what is leadership, communication and listening, um, self-evaluation, evolution, crisis management, trust – all of these pillars, I broke it into eight silos and interviewed each person kind of on those silos and wrote it in an oral history format. So it's actually their words uh, being delivered to you that way. And super cool, like so grateful for their time and insight. And then I do some storytelling before introducing each chapter about okay. my own life and path. So... I hope y'all like it. I really think that you'll get some something out of it that you can incorporate into your daily path, professionally, as a parent. Like my poor son, I'm gonna I'm I'm shut up right here. But my son is 17 and a half years old. All right? He knows everything. Oh yeah. oh yeah. Just yesterday, I used one of the things that Coach Saban said to me, but not only to me. He says this often. He goes, "We're faced with two decisions every single day." There's that thing over here that we really want to do and we're enticed to do, but we know we shouldn't do. Do you do it? And then there's this thing over here that we know we should do and that we have to do to be the best version of self. Do you do it? Hmm. That's life. Yep, it is. And I said that to my son. We're trying to do these college damn entrance uh, applications. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just went through that, man. I have a sophomore now, so I, I'm, oh, I'm with it. Yeah. I need well, a 16 year old boy, so. Coping mechanisms. But <sighs> yeah. anyway, well, uh, September thank you all 26th. so much for having me. I'm so yeah, grateful thank you, for brother. that. Thank you. Have an man. amazing oh, day, man, yeah, and thank all y'all for listening. Yeah, right, we'll, we'll you, send Marty. you some. We'll send some clips over once we get this busted up, Marty. And, yeah, I want everybody out there to know, go check out Marty Smith on all social media platforms. Check him out on the X Twitter anywhere you can. Go watch his show. Listen to his podcast. and Pre-order his book on September 26th. You won't be disappointed. He'll be back in a few months to catch up with us again. But thanks again, Marty Smith. We appreciate you, brother. Safe travels, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, boys. Sounds good. JR, thanks get that man. number over so I can get those millions flowing in, okay? Gotcha, buddy. <laughs> <laughs>